Christian Parenting. So, you're having a baby. I'm Craig Dennison. And I'm Rachel Dennison. And today on So You're Having a Baby, we're covering a topic we personally find so extremely important, marital health with a new baby. And today we have the privilege of talking with the remarkable Deborah Faleda. Before anything else in her life, Deborah is a woman in love with Jesus. And that love has been the driving motivator, propelling her forward in her pursuits as a wife, a mother, a licensed professional counselor, a speaker, and an author. She is married to the love of her life, who pushes her to pursue her dreams and is her number one fan. She and John are parents to three beautiful children, Ella, Elijah, and Ezra. They live in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. She's a licensed professional counselor specializing in dating, marriage, and relationship issues, along with a spectrum of mental health disorders and issues. She's also the author of True Love Dates, Choosing Marriage and Love in Every Season, and the host of the Love and Relationships podcast, a hotline-style show where people call in to get their relationship questions answered. Her popular relationship advice blog, truelovedates.com, reaches millions of people each year with the message of healthy relationships. We're so excited to have Deborah on the podcast. Let's jump into the conversation. Debra, thanks so much for making time to talk to Rachel and me today. We're so excited to talk about marriage and family and relationships in the context of having a new baby and really excited that we're here to talk with you about this subject today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me and for your focus on such important issues. That's great. Oh, absolutely. All right. Well, maybe let's launch into the first the first question. So I've really enjoyed conversations with you in the past. We got to have a conversation with the other thing that I do inside of the first 15 context. And so really excited to talk to you about this. So maybe to kick us off, why don't you have, tell us a little bit about yourself and your family and what you do inside of therapy and true love dates. Sure. Well, I'm a licensed professional counselor. Really, I, I've worked with all areas when it comes to counseling from depression, anxiety, addictions, But right now, I've found myself focusing on the topic of relationships for the past few years, and it's kind of become my specialty as far as marriage and singleness and dating, engagement, and all the different issues that come with that. So it's been such a blessing just to be able to speak into this important area. And personally speaking, I'm a wife, and um, my husband, John, and I have been married for well over a decade, and we've got three kids, ages four, eight, and nine. That's so awesome. Well, we're so honored and really thankful that you're here today. Um, We just consider you an expert in this whole sphere of marriage, especially with a new baby. And I know that for us, not only was like the first time that we had a baby really challenging, but I feel like we even ran into even more issues when we had our second. Yeah. I think it was the life stage that we were in and we found ourselves, you know, just wrestling with communication and having really unhealthy assumptions about each other. I would say I struggled with that more than even Craig did. Craig was traveling a lot for work and we just found that it was really, really, really difficult. So I would love if you could just touch on why you think marriage with a new baby can be so difficult and what are some common issues you've seen married couples run into in the midst of this crazy life transition? Yeah. Difficult is an understatement. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, when you throw this new child um, into the picture. It's funny because I look back on when we were brand new parents with our first child, Ella, and you really have no clue how this little seven pound human being can become the complete dictator of your life with sexual. (laughs) And I mean, all of a sudden you're living in like two to three hour increments you're, you're feeding and changing. And then you've got like an hour in there with, with nap, and then you have to do it all over again. And it, and it, I think it just rocks your world in the most unexpected way. And no matter how many books you read, it's not something you can really prepare for. I mean, you can't really prepare for the, the lack of sleep and the schedule changes and the demands. And so I think it's a shock to the system and it's a shock to the marriage. I mean, it's this big, in, in, in the kindest way, I'll use the word trauma. It's a big trauma. It's a big change. 
And I use the word trauma because I see trauma as a loss of any kind. You know, you have you have a loss of freedom, you have a loss of independence. There's just so much that you lose. So there's so much that you gain as as a brand new parent for sure. And and the gain far outweighs the loss. But for us not to acknowledge that it is a it is a trauma for many of us. Um, and not mm. only that, you've got hormone changes and exhaustion. And a lot of women go through postpartum depression. And so there's a lot of factors that can really influence how a couple navigates through having a new baby. It's it's not just, you know, we just had a baby and let's just keep communicating and, and keep connecting and keep having date nights. It's a lot more difficult than that. And I think the most important thing for a couple to know going into this stage is that it's okay to acknowledge that it's hard. And I think a lot of couples struggle with that because nobody wants to say it's hard. Nobody wants to say it's a struggle. I mean, you guys flat out said it when you, you know, we're just, we're just (laughs) introducing this, how difficult it was. But for so many couples, it's like, you feel like this is the biggest joy and blessing of life. And it almost feels wrong to acknowledge that it's hard. And so I think that's a barrier for many couples. We don't even want to acknowledge how hard it is. And we just want to keep pushing through without realizing, wait a second, this is really difficult. And we've got to recalibrate. We've got a lot of changes have happened. And we really need to figure out how to communicate, how to connect, what we need, you know, how exhausted are we? There's a lot of physical components to this as well as emotional. Oh, that's so true. I love what you're speaking to is this almost sense of validation of our experiences, Yeah. which I, I do think like what you're, what you're saying is so true. It, I think we almost invalidate our experiences because we feel like we just shouldn't feel that way. Right. Like you're saying, like things just so beautiful and good. And, you know, you see people all around you having kids and right. you know, every person that exists today is, was a baby at one point and some, some parent parented them and had them in some form or fashion. And so it's like, almost like, okay, this A should be normal and B should be amazing and wonderful. But in reality, it's for you, it's not normal. I mean, you've lived this whole life up until you have a baby. And there's really, like you're saying, it's like you can read all these books and do all these things. And like what we're trying to do is help people prepare all you can. But there's so much of this you just have to go through and experience. And it is not normal, even though it happens all around you. It's not normal for you. And it is really stretching and challenging. And especially the season with the newborn has its own challenges it can be hard to even get a sense of what's really going on. And so I love what you're voicing is this idea of just getting to simply validate the challenge and the difficulty of it. And I find for myself in my own life, that can almost be like the first win that leads to other wins totally. is just when I can say, this is hard and this sucks. Yeah. And I wish this wasn't this way and mm. whatever it might be in that, that first step of just saying what you feel and what you think and what your experiences leads. Yeah. And even using that as a, as a platform to mm-hmm. connect with your spouse, like you're the only two going through this together. That's and so your good. experience is unique and it's not like anybody else's. It's not like any other couples. Your baby is unique. You know, Ella was so colicky for the first six weeks of her life. And it, honestly, looking back, she was colicky because she wasn't actually getting enough milk and I didn't realize it. But mm-hmm. when you look around, if, if other people are your measuring stick, you know, it, it's going to heap even more difficulty. But when you can step back and say, okay, this is our unique journey. Me and you, we're in this together. Let's let's rely on each other. Let's talk through it together. Let's let's rejoice together. Let's cry together. And, and I feel like the struggle and, and the uniqueness of the struggle that you're experiencing can really bring you together. It's just a matter of being able to acknowledge and validate each other through it. Man, that's so good. And I think that's something me and a lot of my mom friends ran into in the beginning was almost like comparing how hard it was for me to my husband. Yeah. Like, and because of that, coming up against a lot of bitterness in myself, because none of it in my experience was voiced. It was always 
Like if Craig would come home and be like, oh, I have such a hard day. I'd be like, I don't even want to hear it. (laughs) You know, like under my breath. And like, I noticed that that was starting to drive a wedge in between us, you know, and like one of the biggest lessons we've learned in all of this is like, hey, we both had hard days. We both worked our butts off and are exhausted. And it's okay for us to both like feel like this is hard and both struggle and both. I think for the longest time I'd be like, no, you're, you're like complaints aren't even valid because you have no idea what I've been through kind of thing. Yeah. And so a big growth point for us was fighting for each other's needs and not, and like one of the ways that we see, we've seen that really help us is that when you're fighting for your spouse's needs, whether you're the husband or the wife, your needs are ultimately going to be met because you're fighting for each other, you know, and you're like looking out for each other and you're making space for each other to thrive in this season and allowing it to be hard for both of you. Kind of like you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. That's so good. So maybe let's jump into first step of what I hear you saying is this idea of acknowledging that it is hard. And I think in the, in the context of how critical, what I hear all of us saying is how important marriage is with a new baby. Often what I, what I see maybe leading to the next question is, is that marriage is the thing that gets, uh, that gets left behind when a baby comes. Like you're saying, it, they really, it really can be this little dictator. I think of it like a new center of gravity and everything seems to orbit around it. And it doesn't matter how many adults are there. It doesn't matter what else is going on. Everyone's kind of orbiting around this little baby that is at the center of everyone's universe. All of a sudden is what it, what it feels like. And so marriage kind of gets left behind or even in unhealthy ways does orbit around this baby and what it needs as opposed to getting its own focus. Focus. And so maybe just to kick that part of the conversation off, how do you see the value of marriage in the context of having a newborn and how critical it is to maintain a sense of investing in that relationship and caring for it while we're also investing in and caring for a new baby? Yeah. You know, it's funny because I feel like my answer to this question is not always what people expect. I, I was recently at a church and after the service, there was a Q&A time. And a couple stood up and um, you could tell she was like maybe 10 months pregnant. <laughs> like the baby was <laughs> about to arrive. And the husband got <laughs> up and said, how can we nurture our marriage when this new baby comes? Like, do you have any tips, advice, suggestions? And I, I chuckled because my first thought is, you just need to focus on surviving. <laughs> like, mm. like, like, don't get me wrong. It is important to be in tune to your marriage. But the first few months with a newborn is not the time to be looking through a couple's devotional or listening to podcasts or reading marriage books or going to conferences. I mean, the first few months is truly being in tune to each other's needs and learning how to survive this together. Like when I talk about survival, Mm -hmm. I'm saying, okay, are we eating? Are we Mm -hmm. sleeping? Are we taking breaks? You know, physical needs that we don't normally have to think about. I don't normally have to say to my husband, hey, did you sleep enough? Are you doing okay? Did you get enough food? (laughs) Because he's a grown man and he's responsible for himself. But when you throw in a newborn Uh, all all of that shifts, all of that recalibrates. Like you said, your center of gravity is completely different. And now part of taking care of your marriage means taking care of basic physical needs with one another and helping one another um, through that first season of exhaustion. And I think, you know, ultimately by doing that, by taking care of those physical needs, you're making an emotional investment as well. You're, you're showing your spouse, like, I care about you just as much as I care about this baby. What do you need? Do you need me to make you a sandwich? Do you need to go take a quick mm. nap? Can I, can I take this diaper change and you take the next? Like, how can I help you and how can you help me in just the physical space? And I feel like that in and of itself speaks so much in those early months of having a newborn. That's so good. Yeah. I love the ability to kind of reframe and reset expectations inside, especially those first few months of the baby being born, uh, even leading up to that. That's one of the goals I think we have for this podcast and for the book is helping prepare parents for what those first few months are like so that they can kind of venture out into that and the craziness of it kind of at least unified and connected in, in terms of what this could look like and how they could uh, be able to maintain a sense of marital connection in it. And so I love that idea of just 
trying to notice the basic things that each other need to be able to survive this. And there really is that sense of, I think as beautiful with, with the season being so beautiful, if you're surviving and taking care of some of those basic needs and doing that for one another, that really actually produces also the sense of thriving in that season. I think while it's also incredibly stretching and trying and difficult, there's this sense of something of like, when you come through something as a couple that is so hard, that can be traumatizing or is traumatizing and can be really difficult, how unifying and relationship building that can be. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think sometimes we really take for granted the power of those basic needs. You know, uh, when I remember when we had our newborn and even with our second child, when I would wake up to feed the baby and and I remember John would get up with me, not because he had to, but because he just wanted to be there. Like I I I'm going to wake up too and I'll do the diaper change and then he'll, pa- he'll he would pass the baby to me and I would do the feeding. And just that sense that he was like, I'm with you. I'm going to help. I I don't necessarily have the ability to feed the baby, but I can change the diaper and just be present. It was just such an emotional connection, even though he was doing something so physical, something so basic. Um, And it's just amazing the power of just being in tune to each other's needs and how that can really help during those first few months of having a baby. It's really good. Craig did the same thing and it was like the sweetest thing. I can't even describe it. And you know, when you're recovering from birth, it's so intense. Even the act of getting out of bed, like to get the baby is really intense and something that a lot of moms aren't even able to do on their own, you know? So I think that that's such a beautiful idea of the husband as a way for him to be involved and to connect. Have you seen, I don't know, gender roles in that way be like a big issue in a lot of like the people that you counsel? You know, I think maybe 20 years ago or more it would have been, but things are really changing. I mean, (laughs) things have changed so much over the past decade in such a good way. I, 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 I go out to restaurants and I see guys carrying the diaper bag, you know, whereas normally, you know, 20 years ago, that wouldn't even be a thing. It would be the woman who carries the diaper bag and is taking care of all these things. And I just feel like we have moved so much in the right direction where we see this as a collaborative process and especially in healthy Christian families, you know, and that's a beautiful thing about it. It's I can feed the baby. You can feed the baby. There's bottles. Um, I can change diapers. You can change diapers. I can take night feedings. You can take night feedings. It's such a collaborative experience and it's it's so much more normalized now. Gender roles when it comes to this uh, are fading. And so I think it's very encouraging just to see the direction that we're headed. And I also think it's encouraging because we see the importance of a father developing that emotional and physical attachment to their child just as important as the mother developing an emotional and physical attachment. And I just think we're headed in the right direction. I think so too. And Deborah, I just, just for people listening, any moms who maybe feel um, like that's really not the case in their marriage. And I can even, I have a few friends who come to mind, you know, um, who had really different circumstances that maybe came from more traditional backgrounds or their husbands did. And I'm just curious what encouragement you would have for someone who's listening, who feels like that's really not the case in their marriage and they would maybe want it to be. Mm -hmm. Any communication advice for how to maybe voice that sort of desire? Yeah. You know, first and foremost, I think understanding what we need is important and being able to articulate it to ourselves first. Uh, A lot of times we have needs that kind of get stuck in our head and we we dwell on them and, and we're feeling frustrated or bitter or we start feeling resentful, but we step back and say, okay, wait, I actually haven't expressed this. You know, and and you can't hold someone responsible for something you never told them they were responsible for. So I think the key is to step back first and foremost and say, have I communicated this need to my spouse? And even make suggestions, you know, hey, I'm really struggling with sleep. Would you mind taking um, the four o'clock feeding, you know, and, and 
making direct statements, direct suggestions, explaining your direct needs. And if that is a problem, then as a counselor, my my gut tells me the problem r- runs a little bit deeper than gender roles in the marriage. And maybe there's some more work that needs to be done about understanding one another, communicating in a healthy way. There's usually more than than what meets the eye. There's usually more than what's going on underneath the surface. But it, but I would definitely say start by making sure that you've expressed what you need and aren't just assuming that your spouse will do it if he or she wants to. A lot of what we're talking about, I think, you know, the way that you even respond to that first question, Deborah, around just really a goal of survival in those, especially in those first few months in our conversation we're having now, makes makes me think about the the value of strengthening your marriage before the baby arrives, mm-hmm. and the ability to grow in communication and grow and care for one another and understanding and desires, like what what matters and what doesn't to you as an individual and to you as a couple. And, uh, and so what, what encouragement would you have for people if they are pregnant and they're listening to this and they're like, okay, the baby's coming. Like, what can we do right now to strengthen this marital connection and this relationship? So acknowledging that when the baby arrives, there's not as much space or time or capacity to do deep marital work in those first few yeah. months like you're referencing. So what initiating work would you encourage people to do? Yeah. What you said is key. It's, it's really about... You don't wait until the newborn phase to say, hey, let's work on our marriage. It's something that we need to integrate into every part of our life. And, you know, after the newborn stage passes, you know, and and before the newborn stage comes, the work of marriage is something that's so important because if anything, the, that stressful and trying stage probably brings out what's actually going on underneath the surface you know, the tension that might come from it and the, the struggle, it's, it's, it's exacerbated because we're so tired and all this other stuff, but there's probably work that needed to be done in the first place. And so one thing that I think would be really helpful to practice is what I call weekly check-ins. You know, John and I um, started this habit probably a decade ago where we meet once a week um, on a, usually for us, it's a Sunday evening at nine o'clock at night, his iPhone alarm goes off and that means it's check-in time and it's not date night. It's not, you know, I think there should be kind of a difference between work nights and marriage and fun nights. And for us, mm. the dates are the fun nights and check-in night is, is the work, you know, where we sit together face to face, no distractions, no phones. And we ask each other how we're doing. We check in. You know, how are you doing spiritually? How are you doing emotionally? How are we doing relationally? What are we struggling with? What are you struggling with? What do we need to pray about? What do we need to work on? How's our parenting? What, like we really check in on certain problem spots or areas that have a potential to be a struggle or strain in our relationship. And even just personal things that were going through when I was battling uh, depression and anxiety for a season, that seemed to be the one thing we would check up on every single week. You know, how are you doing with that? What's going on? How can I support you? And let me just say, this isn't, it wasn't this natural, easy process. Um, and, And for the women out there who are like, oh, my husband would never suggest something like that. Well, then you suggest it, you know, to be honest, this was something I suggested we start doing. And it doesn't matter who suggests it. It doesn't matter who initiates it or who leads it. What matters is that the other person is willing to do it, you know? And so my husband was more than willing and it's become such a vital part of our, of our marriage. And I really believe that when you have that in place, imagine how convenient it will be to carry that over when there's a newborn. And and maybe it'll look different. Maybe your check-ins will be talking about sleep and talking about, okay, who needs to get this many hours of sleep this week? And how are we going to navigate the schedule? And what do you need? And, you know, it might look different, but when you have that in place already, 
Uh, it just makes for such a smoother transition and the ability to connect with one another, no matter what's going on in your world, you know, whether there's a newborn or not. Wow, that's so good. Uh, that resonates a lot with something Rachel and I have been trying right now, actually. So she said in the beginning, I think the last year of marriage is probably our hardest year of marriage mm -hmm. uh, before the pandemic hit where I just was, everything was stretching. It's like we have two kids now, work is crazy, everything's going nuts. And we just like, we're getting stretched in every, I feel like every, literally every facet of life was getting yeah. pulled. We were getting pulled. Uh, one, one of the things that has really happened, I've noticed since we started having more frequent touch points and check-ins, uh, even in the pandemic, one of the things that we've loved is just like making coffee first thing and trying to wake up and uh, be adults and get time ourselves, before get time with kids. God, get time with each other before the kids uh, are up. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we even uh, just let them stay in the rooms a little bit. <laughs> we need to keep having our conversations so that we walk into parenting with some capacity, yeah. having not be, not meeting the, the needs of our kids very first thing before we've even met and uh, met our own needs or been there for each other. So, um, and so what, one of the things we've been noticing though, in having probably the hardest year of marriage of our, of our marriage in the last 12, 18 months or so, is that as we engaged in those conversations and the check-ins and and recognized where we both were more often, uh, how those conversations got better over time yeah, and how the just getting through them, not doing them perfectly, but having them at all yeah. really helped us improve and understanding one another and loving one another and I think our what's what's really cool too is every time we do that, it feels it does feel like our communication's better for days. Yeah. You know, after after a hard conversation where we're talking about what it looks like to support one another, it's like everything is just a little bit better on the other side. And what a gift that would be for people that are moving into that newborn season where you really need to be there for each other, but you don't have a lot of of capacity to sometimes notice or uh, sometimes have a bunch of time to just do like regular date nights or any of these things. If you can enter into that season connected and already communicating what you need and want clearly, how much, how helpful that could be to that newborn season. Yeah. You already have a plan in place. And I also feel like those check-in times give you a time to personally look in and assess, you know, am I functioning out of empty or am I functioning out of mm. fullness? Because, um, so too many of us function out of emptiness. We're just done. We're depleted. We have nothing left to give. And I think especially in a newborn stage, that's a very realistic thing to feel and experience. But I mean, not just in the newborn stage, it's something that we're all susceptible to at so many different points in our life. And when we're feeling empty, it puts such a strain on our marriage because our spouse isn't made to fill us up. That's not their job. And so being able to pause weekly and look in, you know, and, and just discuss how am I feeling? How empty am I feeling? What do I need? And even checking in spiritually, how am I doing with my walk with the Lord? Like, how am I allowing Jesus to fill me up in this season of life? And how can we keep each other accountable? How can we pray for one another? Just to remember that, that, that fullness um, is an important part of the process and something we need to constantly make sure that we're taking inventory of. I feel like you are very passionate about this idea of dating your spouse. And so I'm thinking like pregnancy, like pre-baby and then past the newborn phase, kind of how we can integrate this idea of dating your spouse. Because I've found that, you know, by the time that Craig gets home from work, I'm depleted, like you're saying. But I remember in this, I did this, it was like a new mom's group at this church in Dallas where we live. And one of the things that, that just stuck with me that they talked about was saving a little bit for your spouse. Mm -hmm. So like saving a little bit of your energy during the day, uh, whether it's the wife or the husband, that when you come home, you have a little bit left for your spouse to like, for attention, for intimacy, for whatever it may be. Like, And I feel like that really like helps with this idea of dating your spouse. And we've talked about it. We talk about it, but a little bit in our workbook, this idea of how fascinated you are with them when you first started dating and you were curious and you were, you know, were eager to talk to them and just the, almost like a mindset of dating again with your spouse. Um, I don't know if you could just share a little bit about your philosophy on that and maybe tell us about the importance of continuing to date your spouse, especially once you have babies and children and they enter the picture and would love to, if you could offer some examples on how to do that. Yeah, for sure. You know, 
I would say I'm passionate about the principle of dating your spouse, but not about the practicals. And what I mean by that is I, I remember um, being in a, a mom's group as well, where the woman that was teaching, and and mind you, I had just had my second child at the time, and they were my kids are 20 months apart. So we had a 20-month-old and a newborn. And I'm 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 exhausted. <laughs> like I could probably <laughs> barely keep my eyes open during that talk. Mm. And John was a resident. Um, he had just finished medical school. He was a resident, so he was working like 100 hours a week. And so life was a little crazy at that point. And I remember her getting up. At, oh, and mind you, we didn't have any money at that point in life either. We were like <laughs> dirt broke. And sh- and she gets up and says, "You need to prioritize your marriage and have a weekly." date night. You need to get out. You need to get a sitter because your marriage is a priority. And I remember hearing that and feeling like terrible because we hadn't had an actual date night like that in months. That was years and years ago. And I have evolved a lot and I've I've learned a lot. And I I look back and I think that was terrible advice in the sense that you can't put that type of pressure on your marriage and in, in, in saying you need a weekly date night out. First of all, there's financial obligations, getting a sitter. Um, we couldn't even afford a sitter. And then, and then if we did afford a sitter, we wouldn't be able to afford dinner because it was too much <laughs> so to true. budget, you know? And, and so it, it almost felt like this legalistic, like you better do this or your marriage is going down. And uh, what I realized is it's not actually about a weekly date night out. It's about making sure you're weekly prioritizing your spouse, at least weekly. You know, it's about making time to connect and to hear each other. That could be sitting on a couch. Um, For us, sometimes that's meant sitting across the dining room table and drinking coffee and pretending we're at a cafe because the kids are in bed and we just hold hands and talk. We don't have to be out. We don't have to be dressed up every time. Every now and again, it's fun to do that and special. But I don't believe that my marriage is going to fall apart if I don't have a weekly date night out. Um, But I do believe that it's, it's so important to prioritize that weekly time to connect with my spouse, whether that means sometimes it's watching Netflix because we're both so tired. Um, Sometimes it's prioritizing intimacy and putting that on the calendar. Sometimes it's a game night or 20 questions or uh, just having a time to pray over our kids. Whatever that is, it's, the question is, are we making time for one another? And, and like you said, do I have something left to give my spouse? And I think that's the key and something that we have to make sure we're prioritizing on a weekly basis. Maybe the the last question that comes to mind for me is this idea of communication, actually, and how we have so many funny stories, in, like the newborn season oh around communication and just how hard it is to like say things in a coherent way, let alone <laughs> like receive things in the way they're intended to be communicated. And uh, we share this story often, but there was this like one night where Rachel was up with the kids and I, I would wake up and our rhythm was, I would, I would get them. And I would, when she was nursing, I would give the baby to her. And then I would like try to stay awake with her a little bit in that. And then I would go put them down. And that was kind of our way that we like supported each other or really I supported her throughout that nighttime season. And so I, I inevitably really well, like inevitably would fall asleep while she was nursing instead of being there actually supportive. Men have and so she'd have the gift of falling asleep. It's the it's <laughs> gift. I really believe it is. <laughs> oh yes. I have no problem falling asleep at any moment. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so she was trying to nudge me to like get up to like take the baby. And I kept saying I needed like, like 10 more minutes. And so she let me keep having these like rhythms of two more minutes until finally I woke up and I like shot up out of bed because she was like, Craig, get up. And I was like, what? It's just what I, it's exactly what I needed is what I said. And I woke up the next morning and I was like very sweet with her. I have no memory of that. Like she is really this story to me many, many times. I have no actual memory of being like that in my communication with her and sounding like Napoleon Dynamite for those that have (laughs) that as a reference point for a movie that you watch. He was so rude. So rude. Oh, it was so rude. I was so done. <laughs> so that's part of the thing we 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 have questions about in that season is like, what do you let go of yeah. from a communication standpoint? So like, wow, that was kind of edgy or 
oh, wow, like, I don't think you're like communicating clearly, but this is crazy for both of us. Like, Mm -hmm. so how do you see communication in that season, knowing that survival really is this goal and that getting through it is the most important thing and getting through it together? But how do you see communication playing a role in, in even getting through that season together? Well, I'll I'll default to what we said a few minutes ago and that I really feel like so much of this is what we build before we get into this season and, and even after. Um, and the, the communication that we're building before we get into this hard season, uh, you know, it's like, you know, just imagine you walk into the loudest party you've ever walked into. People are screaming, there's music blaring, and then you decide, hey, let's sit and have a good conversation with one another. That's just <laughs> ridiculous. You know, the, the expectation there needs to really shift. And I think part of the key in that newborn stage, and something that I'm actually learning, John and I were just talking about this the other day when we we kind of we'd, we'd had a tense, difficult day with a lot of stress from outside influences and just the tension that existed that day. You have to remind yourself that this isn't the time f- for the daily ledger to reset. Uh, you know, sometimes we're like, okay, you did this, I did this, you did this, I did this. How many points do you have today? How many points do I have today? But mm. that's going to kill you in those early years of having a baby. And it's going to kill you in other times of marriage as well. I think what we have to remember is that we are withdrawing from the bank of years of healthy communication, years of grace, years of acts of love and uh, years of commitment to one another, because there's going to be days when I need to make a withdrawal and there's nothing left in this relationship bank. We've communicated terribly. You've been a bad spouse. I've been rude. And if every single day we start the ledger over, we're going to be in big trouble. You know, there's some days that you just have to have the grace to withdraw from the years of work that you've put in before today. You know, mm. and I think seeing it like that kind of gives us hope. It's like we're going to have bad days. You're going to have terrible nights of communication and times when things aren't right. But if we can see marriage as this big bank and that we're constantly depositing, constantly depositing over years, so that when we do have those hard days, when we are depleted, when it's the middle of the night, that I'm not judging my entire relationship based on the interactions from the last 24 hours, I'm pulling from the bank of all of these years of love and commitment and um, just the investment we've made over the years. And that's why I think it's so important. You know, I almost wish we could share this podcast with people years before they decide to have a baby. Because like, okay, we got to start investing. What are we putting in this bank and how, what are we, are we going to have something to be able to withdraw from when those hard days or, or months come along? And so I feel like we just have to kind of adjust our expectations and look at it that way more than a day by day by day experience. That's so good. Yeah. What I hear and what you're saying in, in, in this conversation as we wrap up is, is it's, it's you know, it's never too late to invest in, in your marriage as it, it leads towards family, but it's absolutely never too early either. <laughs> the value of being able to invest in in those acts of love and that communication and those things, ways that you can grow together. And I love that value of being able to look longer term in terms of trying to get some context for the current experiences. I think that's a really valuable principle for the whole of having a baby and realizing that there, it really is this unique window of time and you're starting a family. And so, you know, life is never like what it was before Mm -hmm. again, after you have a baby, but at the same time, it's not always going to be like it is in those first few months of having a baby. That really is a unique challenge and it's a unique season. So seeing it in context of the way that the relationship has been, as well as letting that build to hope for the, the way the relationship can be in the midst of that challenging season, I think is really valuable context that I think can provide a lot of peace and hope. Yeah. And I, and let me just add too, if you're in this stage and you feel like it's, you know, a monstrous season for you, for your marriage, you're really struggling. Um, again, it's never too early to realize, you know what, like we're not going to survive this and we need help. Mm. 
and, you know, to, to pull from help from the community, from your family, but also help from a licensed counselor that can say, okay, guys, yeah. let's, let's get to the root. Maybe there's some underlying stuff here. Maybe you didn't have enough in the emotional bank to begin with, and we've really got to start there. And, um, you know, don't be afraid to re- acknowledge, you know, this is a big struggle and I don't know that our marriage is going to survive it. If you feel like you're at that place, I would really encourage you to take the next steps of getting help and inviting someone to support your marriage, to help you in that process um, and, and get you started on that journey. That's so good. Yeah. Rachel and I, at, even uh, earlier in the pandemic, did some uh, couples counseling together. We're huge advocates for that. We, we joke often that if, you know, if every one of these episodes or every devotional inside of the book uh, ended with, you should consider doing ca- having counseling or therapy, mm-hmm. like we'd be totally great with that. Yeah, It's been so helpful for us and uh, so helpful for so many people that we know and love. And uh, But I love that idea of, of if recognizing where you are and what you need and inviting people to be an extra support mechanism even kind of circles back to the way that we started with was just trying to make space to be honest and acknowledge where you are and what your experiences are and validate that and uh, and fight for it in the sense of bringing whatever you need in to be able to provide support in the midst of this season as early as you can. Well, maybe Deborah, as we close, would you mind praying over us and over those that are listening uh, over this crazy season that is having a newborn and pregnancy and everything that's involved in all of that? Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. Jesus, we just thank you for the gift of new life, and um, we just thank you for the joys that you have um, and the blessing that it is to have a child and um, to be able to raise them up to love and honor you. And um, I just thank you for the sacrifices that we get to experience as parents and the love that we get to experience because it gives us a glimpse of, of you and how you love and give to us. And I just pray, God, for everybody who is walking through uh, preparing for a newborn or in that that in the thick of having a newborn, that you would just give them uh, a healthy perspective about how they're doing and what they need and how full or empty they're feeling, that they would be able to take the time to really look in um, and that you would just reveal to them in this season what they need to thrive and what it looks like to be filled by you and your presence and and what it means to communicate their needs to their spouse. And um, if you're exposing hard things in this season, I pray that they would have the courage to deal with those hard things and um, not to not to ignore them or pretend they're not there, but just to really call it out and to ask for help, God. And We just thank you that you give us what we need for each stage of life. And we just ask that you would do that for each person listening today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much for listening to today's episode of So You're Having a Baby. We are so thankful for listeners like you. If you enjoyed what we talked about today and enjoyed the conversation, if this has been meaningful for you, we would be so honored if you would rate and review. We love to read the reviews on our podcast, and it's just a cool connection point for real people like you that are enjoying it and listening. As always, if you want more content from us, check out our book. We are so excited about our beautiful workbook. You can go to christianparenting.org to find it. It's a parent's guide to a new baby. We know that parenting a newborn is real hard, but we're here to help. 